Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode 5 in my series on who wrote the Bible. In previous episodes, we looked at what Christians call the Old Testament, or what we Jews simply call the Bible. So, we looked at the Torah, also known as the Pentateuch, the Nevi'im, which means prophets, and the Ketuvim, which means writings. Together, these three sections make up the Jewish Bible, which is also known as the Tanakh. The Protestant Old Testament is identical to the Jewish Bible, except that the order of the books is a bit different. We also looked at the Apocrypha, or Deuterocanonicals, which are the extra books that the Catholic and Orthodox Christians include in their Old Testament. In the next several episodes, we are therefore going to be turning our attention to the New Testament. Virtually all Christians use the exact same New Testament, and it has 27 books. There are four Gospels, the Book of Acts, 21 Epistles, meaning letters, and the Book of Revelation. In this episode, we are going to start by covering the Gospels and the Book of Acts. This episode is also a special collaboration with the YouTube channel Religion for Breakfast. Andrew, the host of that channel, has also prepared a video about the Gospels. So when you're finished watching this one, be sure to follow the link on screen or in the description to check out his video. So, the New Testament doesn't tell the story of Jesus only once. It tells it four times. Basically, that's what the Gospels are. They are four slightly different versions of the same story. A story about a guy named Jesus who, among other things, was a teacher, a healer, and, according to Christians, God in the flesh. So, the four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are placed in this order because, originally, that was the order in which they were thought to have been written. However, as we'll soon see, we now know that this probably was not the order in which they were written. One thing that is clear about the Gospels is that one of them is very different from the others. That's the Gospel of John. The other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are known as the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic meaning seen together. Although they have some differences, they also share a lot in common. If you think of each gospel as being like four essays written by four different students, any teacher would immediately come to the conclusion that three out of the four students cheated. Either somebody copied from somebody, or they all worked together, or they all downloaded the same essay off the internet and made a few changes, hoping the teacher wouldn't notice. The puzzle over who copied who has intrigued scholars ever since the Gospels were written. In academic circles, it is known as the synoptic problem, and there have been a lot of different theories put forward about how to solve the mystery. I'm going to look at three of them. However, before I do that, let me quickly talk about the authors themselves. Contrary to popular belief, there are actually no author names attached to any of the four Gospels. The attributions to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are simply based on tradition. Two of the names, Matthew and John, are names belonging to the list of Jesus' twelve disciples. Mark is thought to have been an assistant to Peter, the leader of the twelve disciples. And Luke is thought to have been an assistant to Paul, arguably the most important figure in the development of early Christianity. So, in other words, all four Gospels have strong associations with very important early Christian figures. But did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually write the Gospels that are attributed to them? Well, according to most conservative Christian scholars, the answer is yes. However, according to most critical scholars, the answer is probably not. Either way, I think it's useful to think of each author as representing more of a community or tradition rather than a single author. We saw something similar when we looked at the Old Testament prophets. For example, the book of Ezekiel was probably not actually written by Ezekiel. 
However, it was probably written by a member of a school of thought that originated with a man named Ezekiel. In a similar manner, even if the Gospel of Matthew wasn't actually written by Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, it was likely written by an author who belonged to some sort of community that had a connection to Matthew. So with that said, let's now look at three possible solutions to the synoptic problem. I'll start with the one that is by far the most accepted solution these days. It is called the two-source hypothesis. This hypothesis is based on the idea that Mark was written first, and that both Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source. However, it also introduces the idea of a second source, which was available to both Matthew and Luke, but not to Mark. This second source is called Q, but unfortunately, it no longer exists. The idea is that Q was simply a collection of short sayings attributed to Jesus. Some of the reasons why most scholars believe that Mark was written first include the fact that it is the shortest of the three synoptics, with very little material that is not found in the other two, as well as the fact that it uses grammar that is less refined and a theology that is more primitive. So the basic idea is that both Matthew and Luke took what they found in Mark and attempted to improve on it, both by adding more content and by tidying up the language. The second most popular solution is generally known as the Griesbach hypothesis, named after a German scholar who wrote about it almost 250 years ago. However, although this hypothesis is an older one, it's actually seeing kind of a rebirth these days. It argues that Matthew was written first and that Luke was written second, using Matthew as a source, meaning that Mark was actually written last. The idea is that Matthew wrote his gospel at a time when the Christian church was primarily still comprised of Jews that Luke wrote his gospel after Paul started to spread Christianity to the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, and that Mark wrote his gospel as a way to summarize the previous two and to put Peter's stamp of approval on both of them. Now, it is in fact true that Matthew is the most Jewishy gospel of the three and that Luke is the most Gentile-focused. In fact, if we go by tradition, Luke is the only author in the entire Bible, both old and new, that was not Jewish. Tradition holds that he was Greek and that he was a medical doctor by profession. However, according to critical scholarship, Luke may have simply been a Hellenized Jew. But the main problem with the Griesbach hypothesis concerns Mark. If Mark wrote last and had Matthew and Luke as references, why did he leave out key events such as the birth story and the post-resurrection appearances? Note that the oldest manuscripts of Mark end with chapter 16, verse 8, in which three women discover the empty tomb and simply run away, afraid. Almost all scholars agree that verses 9 to 19 were added much later. The last solution we're going to look at is a bit of a wild card. It's the most cutting-edge solution and therefore does not currently have widespread acceptance. It's called the Q plus Papias hypothesis and was put forward by a professor named Dennis MacDonald. MacDonald is also known for putting forward the idea that the Gospel of Mark was modeled on the works of Homer. Like the two-source solution, this hypothesis holds that Q and Mark were written first. However, it differs in that it posits that Q was written before Mark and that Mark had access to it. This is why we get the term Q+. MacDonald adds more material to the hypothetical Q document material which otherwise is usually assigned to Mark. Next comes Matthew, who had access to both Q plus and Mark. And then he adds a document called Papias, 
Papias was an early bishop who lived from around 60 to 130 CE. We know from later authors that he wrote a text called The Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord. This source is now lost. However, we have quotations from it found in the works of later authors. From these quotations, we know that Papias had access to three earlier sources. MacDonald suggests that these were Q+, Mark, and Matthew. Finally, the last synoptic author to write was Luke. Luke presumably would have had access to all four previous works. Okay, so that covers the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'll place them on a timeline in a bit, but first, let's talk about John and Acts. John, of course, is the fourth gospel, but like I said earlier, it has very little in common with the other three. It's almost as if John is telling a completely different story. He adds lots of events that aren't mentioned in the other three, and leaves out lots of events that are. And whereas the synoptic Gospels have Jesus giving a lot of short sayings, John more often has him giving longer, more complex speeches. One thing that most scholars agree on is that John's Gospel is more theological, whereas the other three are more straightforward narratives. What do I mean when I say theological? I should probably elaborate because I've used the word several times in my various Bible videos, but have never really explained myself. For example, I keep repeating that we have to remember that the Bible was written in order to make theological points, not to simply record history. You see, nowadays we tend to divide all writing into two categories. It's either fiction or nonfiction. But ancient people didn't do this. Instead, they mixed the two, especially when talking about topics that are difficult to explain, like, you know, anything to do with God or theology. The word theology simply means the study of God. For example, the authors of the Jewish Bible held certain beliefs about God that they wanted to express, such as the idea that there is only one God and that God exists outside of the natural world. When they wrote, they weren't simply saying, this happened, and then this happened, and then this, and so forth. Instead, they took people that they thought had existed in the past and made them into literary characters. They embellished the stories that they had heard about them and sometimes even placed words into their mouths, words that expressed the ideas that they wanted to communicate in the present. In the Jewish Bible, Even God is a literary character. This is why God often seems quite different, depending on which particular book you're reading. Does this mean that God doesn't really exist? Well, not necessarily. Personally, I believe in God. Maybe you do too. Maybe you don't. But either way, I think it's important to understand that the God of the Bible isn't necessarily the God of reality. Rather, the God of the Bible is simply various authors' portrayal of God. Whether you believe that portrayal is accurate, inaccurate, or somewhere in between, that's up to you. And I think the same goes for the character of Jesus, especially in the case of John's Gospel. Obviously, many Christians believe that Jesus said every single word that the Gospels say he said. But it's also possible that the gospel writers took some artistic liberties, that they crafted their stories in a way so that they could make a point about who they thought Jesus was, rather than simply record, he did this, and then he did that, and so forth. For example, Mark has Jesus hanging on the cross in pain, shouting as he dies, whereas John has him calmly making deep statements and then dying in a very serene way. Okay, one more thing about the Gospel of John. According to some scholars, John has at least two layers. Instead of using the Q source, which was simply a list of Jesus' short sayings, it seems that John instead may have used a now-lost source known as the Signs Gospel. 
a text that listed the various miracles that Jesus was said to have performed. It's possible that John, or more likely a follower of John, used the signs gospel as a starting point and then worked the rest of the material around it. Next up is the book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles. Whereas the Gospels tell the story of Jesus up until his death and resurrection, Acts tells us the story of what his disciples, aka the Apostles, did after he was gone. In other words, it tells the story of how the Christian church came to exist. And we happen to know who wrote it. Well, kind of. The person who wrote the book of Acts is the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So traditionally, that would be Luke the physician. In other words, Luke Acts is actually a two-part work that has been unfortunately split up. A better way to arrange the first five books of the New Testament might be to order them like this. First, Mark, then Matthew, then Luke Acts, then John. Let's now bring up a timeline. Every line on this chart represents a block of 10 years. Let's first add the lifetime of Jesus. There are various theories out there about when exactly Jesus was born, when exactly he died, and even whether or not he existed in the first place. The mainstream position is that he did in fact exist, and the most commonly used dates for his lifespan are 4 BCE to 30 CE. This means that in the year 100 CE, there were still people alive who would have known Jesus. Now, other than Jesus himself, the most important person when it comes to the development of early Christianity is Paul. Paul was not one of Jesus' disciples when Jesus was still alive. Instead, he became a follower a few years after Jesus died, somewhere between 34 and 37 CE. Although Paul himself was a Jew, he was the person primarily responsible for taking Christianity from being a minor sect of Judaism and making it into a brand new religion that consisted mostly of non-Jews. Traditionally, Paul is said to have lived up until the reign of Emperor Nero and was killed sometime between 64 and 68 CE. We'll be talking about Paul more in the next episode when we delve into the epistles, but for now I thought it would be useful to put him on the chart for reference. Now, the most important date for understanding the development of both Judaism and Christianity is the year 70 CE. I mentioned that date in last week's video as the date for when the Second Temple was destroyed. Prior to this pivotal event, Judaism was a diverse religion with many different branches, one of which was early Christianity. But the destruction of the Temple forced Judaism to evolve. Personally, I like to think of 70 CE as the date for which both Christianity and Rabbinical Judaism were truly born. Both religions developed as a way to deal with the loss of the Temple. On one hand, the rabbis shifted the focus onto studying the Torah and meeting in synagogues for prayer, whereas on the other hand, the Christians shifted the focus onto the person of Jesus and on seeing his death as the replacement for the earlier Temple sacrifices. All three of the Synoptic Gospels reference the destruction of the Temple. Unless one interprets these as being real prophecies, which many Christians do, this means that the earliest date for any of the Synoptic Gospels is 70 CE. Most scholars do place Mark somewhere just shortly after 70 CE, and then Matthew and Luke Acts somewhere around 10 years later. Q, if it did exist, would be placed before 70 CE, perhaps as early as the year 40. John, on the other hand, is usually placed last, around the year 100 CE. So, even though the Gospels may not have been written by the individuals they are now named after, they were all likely written 
during a time when people who had known Jesus were still alive. Which means, even if you're like me and don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, the Gospels are still fairly good sources for gathering some basic information about his life. Now, before I go, I want to address one more topic. Since I won't be doing a separate episode on the New Testament Apocrypha, I thought I'd bring up the most famous gospel that didn't make the final cut, the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is one of many other non-canonical gospels that still exist. That's right, we have dozens of other gospels beyond just the four that made it into the New Testament. Most of these are thought to have been written much later. However, the Gospel of Thomas is the exception to this rule. According to some scholars, it may have been written around the same time as the main four. The other interesting thing about the Gospel of Thomas is that it was lost to time until a manuscript of it was found in 1945. You can imagine how excited biblical scholars were when this happened. At first, many thought it might be the Q source that had supposedly gone missing. This is because Thomas is primarily a collection of short sayings attributed to Jesus. However, when it was compared to the synoptics, it became clear that Thomas was not Q. It's similar, but it's obvious from the text that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not use the Gospel of Thomas when writing their own Gospels. So, who wrote this quote-unquote fifth Gospel, and how does it relate to the other four? Well, like I mentioned earlier, it is best to think of the Gospels as being the products of certain camps or communities, rather than the works of single authors. So, for example, some scholars posit the existence of a Thomasine community and a Johannine community within early Christianity. The followers of Thomas saw the resurrection as being more of an act of spiritual enlightenment, whereas the followers of John saw it as being more of a factual, bodily resurrection. This would explain why John's gospel paints the Thomas character as being the infamous doubting Thomas, which just goes to show there was much disagreement among early Christians on how to understand Jesus. In fact, even the most conservative Christian scholars will admit that it took hundreds of years before all the various so-called heresies were stamped out, and the more standard form of Christianity that we know today took hold. The fact that early on there was not a single Christianity but rather many Christianities, is an important point that we will return to when we take a look at the Quran. Okay, so that concludes our look at the Gospels and Acts. In our next episode, we will look at the Epistles. For the full list of episodes, check out the links in the description. And while you're there, don't forget to check out the video by Religion for Breakfast. Or you can simply click on the thumbnail, which is on screen, right now. Thanks for watching.